Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike. And today, I kind of want to give my thoughts regarding Warhammer 40k. Uh, I was inspired, I'm inspired to kind of do this episode because recently I've been getting into Space Marine 2 with my brother, and I've been having a ton of fun with it. But, uh, you know, I've always kind of had like a mixed feeling about Warhammer 40k as a franchise. I think there's a lot of things that it does well, but there are like a few gripes that I have with kind of how it tells its story. So I guess to begin this whole discussion, I'll talk with, uh, I'll begin, I'll start with uh, what I like about Warhammer 40k. So first and foremost, I think the art is amazing. I like how you could take anything from Warhammer, like you could pull it out of context and show it to somebody, and you can and you could like immediately know that oh, this is from Warhammer 40k. You know, all the designs are very distinct in that way. Or at the very least, if it's not from Warhammer 40k, you could tell like oh, this is like inspired by Warhammer 40k. And I, I get how because of how old Warhammer 40k is, and you know, just like its influence on like. Thing. like it was kind of the progenitor of like a lot of grim dark sci-fi designs that we see today but i think even with that in mind um a lot of the uniqueness of the designs have just carried over throughout the years to where um even with a lot of uh in warhammer with a lot of like alien designs i find because obviously the most iconic part of warhammer is like the you know the space marines like they're like the i know uh, no how would you say it like the poster children of the franchise but uh also giving credit to like the design of um if i and i apologize because i'm approaching this i should i should emphasize before i go further that i am approaching this as kind of a a tourist of the franchise but uh if i'm using the term correctly the tau uh you know the Xenos, like every everything that like even just beyond the Space Marines, everything I think is very well designed in Warhammer 40k. I love like the absurdity of like their war machines and everything. It's just it all comes together to to create like just such an interesting aesthetic, which I think does bring a lot of people in uh, to the franchise and myself included. I think it. Um, I think the art really does a lot for the appeal of Warhammer. Uh, 40k um i also admittedly i just like a lot of the side projects associated with warhammer 40k now i've never really played the main tabletop you know war sim game myself only because i don't have the money for that you know my my expensive hobby is magic the gathering so unfortunately i just have never had the funds to invest in warhammer 40k like that but um so a lot of my engagement with it has been through mainly like video games, right? Uh, as I said, um, so like for example, like Space Marine Two, I've been having a lot of fun with. Uh, Space Marine Two is just a great game. It really, for me, it really harkens back to like Xbox 360 era of like multiplayer games. You know, before this whole live service fad that we've had. Um, you know, just getting together with like a group of friends to do like you know missions or even playing some of the pvp it's just been like a ton of fun um but even beyond that i've also played dark tide which is fun it's like a really good uh i guess left for dead like is how i would explain it but i think it's uh, really fun great music in that one um i've heard good things about bolt gun unfortunately i haven't had a chance to play it uh even like um Magic the Gathering, when I was getting back into it and when I was getting into the Commander format, one of the first decks that I uh, invested in was the... They they created, like, these themed decks for Warhammer 40k, and I think I picked up, like, the Chaos... Yeah, the Chaos Marines one. And, uh, and it's... I, I really like how much of Warhammer... How much of uh, the flavor of Warhammer 40k it translated into a lot of those cards... You know, with like the ruinous powers, and um, you know, just just uh, I, I think um, right now I run a commander Lucius the Eternal for one of my decks. Um, 
So no, I, I think uh, a lot of Warhammer 40k does really well, like even outside of the main tabletop game, it does really, it translates really well to so many different like genres. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, how much, um, how would I say, like uh, kind of guidance games workshop, uh, you know, the main like publisher, the main distributor of uh, Warhammer 40k uh, does in like, you know, guiding people who work with their uh, franchise. I think they do a really good job of translating it outside of just, you know, the main tabletop game. So I think I think that's I think that's another bonus to Warhammer 40k. Uh I also admittedly I I do find the lore I don't know if I'd say so much interesting because I'll get to that more in my criticisms, but um I do like how it I guess it is approached in Warhammer 40k, I guess with like its depth and how, you know, um now I, I know I did like a previous episode a while back, you know, kind of questioning that if every like, you know, fantasy or sci fi franchise needs to have this deep lore, especially since a lot of times people don't really engage with it. The example I gave was Magic the Gathering as like one. Right. Um, but I, w- I will say if you are going to build lore for, you know, your whatever franchise you're going to put out there, I think bottling it after like what Warhammer 40K does with its lore is like probably the way to go. I think they handle it really well. I like, you know, there's like a good depth to it for like if you really want to get like, uh, you know, lost in the sauce of it. Um, that is, you know, I would recommend like taking that kind of approach, but, um, no, I, I think, um, you know, there is a lot of, um, I, I like how each unit has like, well, not each unit, um, trying to use the right terminology again, I apologize, complete tourist here. So I might like mess up some terms here or there, but like, uh, each, I guess I would say like faction, as its like own story and how it fits into like the canon and how it's told through like uh these tales of different battles and stuff like that um i think is really interesting and you and i'm telling you you could just get lost in it like there are pages of it whole books you know uh and again this kind of ties into like the second point i was mentioning where hammer so distributed distributed ah sorry distributed across multiple mediums and you know ways that the story is told that there is something for you to you know pick up like if you like reading there's like books video games there's video games like what have you um the only thing they haven't really nailed i think is like uh like online like card games you know i think those are what i've told like kind of bad unless i'm wrong again maybe i haven't found like the one good warhammer like online card game you know, similar to like Legends of Ruterra or whatever, but uh, no, I, I think uh, I do. I do at the very least respect how Warhammer 40k uh, approaches its lore, but with that, it comes with kind of a caveat. Getting into like more of uh, my criticisms, and I guess I'll start with kind of the lighter one because this one might be more on me than anything. But uh, I think a lot of Warhammer like you know projects or whatever a lot of this um media has kind of a problem with onboarding and what i mean by that is at at least for me with a lot of the warhammer 40k uh games that i've you know played over the years or whatever it kind of the 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 thing the the piece of media or whatever the video game or whatever kind of assumes that you know a bit about warhammer 40k before going in Right, and it's not it's not completely bad. Like, um, for an example, like Dark Tide, for example, you could follow the general gist of Dark Tide even without necessarily knowing about Warhammer, because you you can understand the general gist. And again, this is like basic way of explaining it. But like, you're like a prisoner working in like this um, indentured servitude program for, as a part of your like prison sentence, and you're like doing highly dangerous missions as part of like this army whatever right and so like yeah the basics you can understand of like what you're doing in these games or 
what have you. But occasionally when like playing Dark Tide, I, I would notice that they would throw out like some terminology that I don't like really understand. And maybe it's something that you like pick up on as you, you know, engage with Warhammer 40k more. Like maybe you pick on like in context you could kind of understand some of this terminology. Um and for myself, um uh, I remember a while back ago a friend was trying to get me into Warhammer 40k. And he recommended me to like a uh, like a YouTube series. Um, I apologize, I don't remember the name of it, but like for any anybody that listens to this, you might know what I'm talking about. It's like somebody takes like 2D cutouts of like Warhammer, like pictures or whatever of like soldiers or what have you, and they're like you know you flipping back and forth, and they would talk about like Warhammer stuff really bad. Um. But there was one that it was like two guardsmen, I think, talking about like the origins of like the this conflict or whatever, and talking about like the god emperor or what have you. And so I, I kind of had exposure from that, but I'm trying to think in the perspective of like, okay, if I just want to pick up like Dark Tide, how well would Dark Tide convey like, you know, the world of Warhammer 40k, or would I have to like look up stuff outside of it? And I think, um, yeah, I think like a lot of game or a lot of Warhammer 40k read it runs into that problem where, you know, you have to like look into supplemental material in order to understand a lot of it. Like a lot of it isn't necessarily fully conveyed through the game and not necessarily a bad thing. And again, maybe it's I haven't been engaging with the right Warhammer 40k properties. I would like to know in the comments, maybe. Maybe there is stuff that you could point me to that does serve as a better like starting point for like if somebody wants to get into Warhammer 40k outside of you know investing in the tabletop game because again very expensive that's also kind of a barrier for it but whatever um, but yeah so I think I could kind of have like an onboarding issue in that regard uh, another issue and I think one that um, I I apologize for how I have to approach the language in this section because YouTube can be a little weird with how you, you know, talk about like political terminology, but like for anybody that's listening, uh, you know that Warhammer can kind of have an issue with uh I guess I'll say more politically reactionary uh fans within its like, you know, fandom. Um and I get I I want to stress that like if you like Warhammer 40k, it's not that you don't necessarily belong to that group, right? Like I've said, there's plenty of like reasons why somebody might like Warhammer 40k. Maybe they just engage with it on like a surface level thing, and they don't really think about like the deeper politics of like the world or whatever the deeper politics or themes of the world, and that's completely fine, right? Or you know. Um, Again, maybe it's just through like a. Maybe it's just like through relating it through, uh, you know, enjoying it through like, you know, oh, I play Magic the Gathering and I happen to use like one card from like the Warhammer 40k decks, but beyond that, I don't really engage with it. Like, there's plenty, point is, there's plenty of reasons to like Warhammer 40k outside of, you know, being a part of that like reactionary group. But at the same time, especially, you know, being a part of this online space, it is something that you kind of have to, I think, in some form or another, contend with. Um, not to say that there hasn't been efforts to, like, you know, push against it. Like, I think a lot of the, you know, the larger subreddits of Warhammer 40k have rules against, like, you know, pushing that type of ideology. And even um, Games Workshop has. But I was statement saying that they don't condone that type of ideology, but um nonetheless, it is still like I said, you still do have to like not not address it, but it's still an aspect of the like fandom that you know it it does exist right, and I think well, for me, part of the issue of why I think it is kind of um as prevalent as it is. Is that um? Well, I, okay. I guess I'll start with this now. I've heard, like because I've heard from a lot of Warhammer 40k fans 
that you know the the franchise in general uh is supposed to serve as like a criticism of that type of ideology of you know totalitarianism and obviously war right i think uh i've read somewhere that you know when it was first conceived it was kind of like as a I mean, again, I don't know how accurate this is, but that was conceived as like a criticism of at the you know of Thatcher era uh, conservatism, right? Um, and granted, if you pull away, I can see how that point, like, kind of how how Warhammer Forty K does serve as a criticism of the types of ideology. Because, like, you know, the world of Horrorhammer 40k is not desirable, right? At, at least from my take, it is not desirable at all. Like, you're either waiting to die, you're either dying in a conflict or waiting to die in a conflict. Your culture is just built around, like, war. There's nothing beyond that, you know, um... And honestly, no side has any real plans if they hypothetically, like, win. You know, like, the Imperium of Man has nothing if... Because, I, although, again, they won't win this, like, forever conflict that they're in. But if, hypothetically, like, the Imperium of Man, like, conquered all their enemies, I feel like they would just self-cannibalize themselves with all these different factions that exist within itself. Like, I just don't think it's stable beyond, like, their current state of just constant war, right? And that's that's awful, and because war war is kind of bad. Um, so yeah, I, again, like if you pull yourself back and observe like Warhammer, you know, from outs, you know, from the outside, like yeah, it, I could see how you could you could get a sense that it um, you know, serves as a critique of that ideology and what have you. But the problem is. Is that um, I think I think that only works if you have uh, if you're coming into Warhammer with the kind of I guess uh, for lack of a better term the assumption that like oh war is bad totalitarianism is bad but if you don't and you think like you're either neutral on those ideas or you're like those ideas and you go into Warhammer 40k I don't think there's anything within the lore that really uh challenges that right and part of that is because it is played very straight in Warhammer 40k when I was initially like conceiving of this episode I was actually going to do it um talking in correlation to like Helldivers 2 because Helldivers 2 I think also has kind of a similar problem granted in Helldivers 2 uh, the criticism is focused on American jingoism, but it kind of has the same problem where, you know, a lot of it is played very straight. Although, giving more credit to Helldivers 2, there is stuff within its lore that does more directly kind of critique those ideas, I think more so than Warhammer 40k. Um, but yeah, because it's played st so straight in these franchises in like Warhammer 40k and Helldivers 2, it's very hard to kind of mold that critique using, you know, storytelling within the world. Uh, and part of it, I, part of it, I kind of get because, you know, it, it would help, for example, to have like dissenting voices within the world of Warhammer 40k, but I know that can't be the case because, again, from my understanding, um, the, the Imperium has progressed, like, so far in its rule that any dissenting voice is, is like, immediately quashed, like, instantly quashed. So I get, like, why you don't really get, you know, why you don't really have a lot of dissent against, like, the Imperium, like, the rule of the Imperium of Man in you know, Warhammer 40k, or again, at least from the media I've engaged with, maybe there are stories of people dissenting against it, but like, you know, dissenting against it for, you know, like political reasons, because there is like opposition to the Imperium of Man, but it's from, it's not from an ideological standpoint, it's more so just from, oh, the, like the Chaos Marines aren't the ones on top, like if the Chaos Marines somehow won this larger scale conflict 
they would be having, you know, they would also be imposing their own totalitarian rule that might, you know, that would probably be worse than the Pyramid of Man. Or, again, I apologize if I'm using these terms incorrectly. It's just how I've been picking up on things. Um, but, yeah, I think that's kind of the issue, and I'm not sure how you would necessarily... So I, I guess I would like to see more stories about, like, dissent against it, but I don't think it's, like, in the structure of a lot of Warhammer 40k, like, media. Um, I, I Again, in the com and maybe I'm wrong, but in the comments maybe point me to, like, you know, maybe if there is more dissent and, you know, in the world of 40k and I'm just not aware of it, but that's just, like, that's just the general vibe. And I know that a lot of, and granted, I know that a lot of, uh, you know, the reactionary uh, aspect of, like, the fandom engages with it in good in bad faith. It's, like, what happens with any other form of media, like, the boys or what have you. Like, they just misinterpret things to purposely, fill, uh, you know, fit their, like, terrible worldview. And you can't avoid that on some level. And I, I do give credit to Games Workshop, again, for, like, you know, pushing against that in, like, public statement but oh no i i mean i don't want to be too cynical about it i, I feel like i don't know is, is it like one of those things i wonder where like games workshop you know on one hand they they like have to kind of condemn that side of like the fandom but at the same time they know that that is like a i don't want to say sizable because granted i don't know like with actual ratio of it is but it is like a portion of their fan base that they kind of do have to like sell to right because they are like a company i i don't know i i want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say you know in that regard so i'll, I'll just leave it at that but um no i guess that's um all i have to really say about warhammer uh 40k i guess i will end it with this uh I do. It's so funny when I'm playing like Space Marine Two. I I gotta admit I like the Chaos Marines, man. Um, it's just like because I'm we're we're doing like this mission, right? I can't remember what the the mission was in like the main storyline, and you know it's like the first time you come across like Chaos Marines in the story, and like immediately they start using like magic. And stuff you fight like a bot. I don't want to spoil too much. I apologize. Spoiler alert: If you know, you could go ahead and leave the episode right now. I'm pretty much done talking. This just be rambling about nonsense. Uh, you know, that's always what I do. Anyways, whatever. Anyways, um, yeah, you you come to like this mission right, and you fight this like chaos marine boss, and he's so cool. I'm sorry, he's so cool. Like he gets magic, and he's like warping the arena around you. I'm just sitting here. I'm just like sitting with the controller in my hand, thinking like we're, we're kind of lame. Like we're just using guns to shoot at this guy. Like and they get magic. Like why am I fighting for this side? You know. Uh, but it's. Whatever, you know. Uh, take care, everyone.